Muy buenos días y muchas gracias por acompañarnos en la conferencia del día de hoy titulada Localizando el colectivismo, un ADN de bricolaje en el arte del siglo XX en Japón. En inglés, Localizing Collectivism, a do-it-yourself DNA in the 20th century art in Japan, a cargo de la doctora Reiko Tomi y organizada en colaboración con el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Querétaro. Mi nombre es Ileana Rojas y soy coordinadora de actividades culturales de la Fundación Japón en México. Antes de iniciar la sesión, me gustaría darle la bienvenida al director Papus von Senger, del Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Querétaro, quien nos acompaña el día de hoy. Director, le cedo la palabra. Muy buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidos a estas conversaciones. Es un placer para nosotros poder trabajar con la Japan Foundation y contar con la presencia de la doctora Reiko Tomi para estas pláticas. Eh, el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo Querétaro es un museo que tenemos tres años y medio abiertos y además de promover el, eh, exposiciones de arte contemporáneo es muy importante para nosotros la parte educativa, la parte teórica Creo que el museo es una extensión en general de, eh, es una opción de educación mucho más rápida y mucho más este, actual a veces que hasta la de las mismas escuelas. Así que hemos insistido mucho en tener este tipo de organizaciones. Eh, muchísimas gracias por, por la oportunidad de hacer esta colaboración y quisiera introducir y presentar a la subdirectora del Japan Foundation México, Marisato, para que nos dé unas palabras. Bienvenidos todos. Hola a todos. A nombre de la Fundación Japón en México, es un gran placer darles la bienvenida a todos ustedes en esta conferencia realizada en colaboración con el Museo Arte Contemporáneo de Querétaro. Estamos muy emocionados de organizar por primera vez una conferencia con este importante museo. Para la Fundación Japón, el Bajío es muy importante, ya que en estos estados hay una comunidad grande de japoneses viviendo y trabajando. A su vez, hay mucho interés por parte de los mexicanos por conocer más acerca de la cultura japonesa y sus expresiones artísticas. La Fundación Japón es una organización parte del gobierno de Japón que difunde la cultura japonesa, promueve el aprendizaje del idioma japonés y propicia el diálogo. La Oficina de México busca eh, descentralizar sus esfuerzos de difusión. Es por eso que encontramos en el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Querétaro un aliado para compartir con un público diferente un tema del que poco se ha hablado en México, el arte japonés de la posguerra. Me gustaría agradecer al director Papus von Sanger y a su equipo de trabajo por aceptar el proyecto. Esperamos que estos acercamientos continúen en un futuro cercano con exposiciones y otras actividades. Aprovecho la oportunidad para también agradecer a la doctora Reiko Tomi por su interés en compartir con México su pasión de vida, el estudio del arte japonés de los años 60. Estoy segura de que la conferencia que tiene preparada el día de hoy acerca del colectivismo en el arte japonés cerrará con broche de oro el ciclo de conferencias que hemos tenido en el mes de marzo y nos permitirá analizar la historia del siglo XX del arte de Japón con mayor información y desde otra perspectiva. Muchas gracias y disfruten de la ponencia. Muchas gracias, Satosan. Muchas gracias, director. Ahora, antes de cederle la palabra a nuestra ponente, me gustaría leer su semblanza. Reiko Tomi es una académica independiente y curadora especializada en la historia del arte japonés de la posguerra. 
después de recibir su Ph.D. en Historia del Arte Estadounidense de posguerra de la Universidad de Texas en Austin, fue parte del Centro de Arte Contemporáneo Internacional, SICA, donde trabajó con el archivo personal de Yayoi Kusama. La doctora Tommy colaboró con la curadora Alexandra Monroe en la primera retrospectiva de Kusama en los Estados Unidos, así como en la exposición Japanese Art After 1955, Scream Against the Sky, que se centró en la historia del arte japonés posterior a 1945. Desde 1992, como curadora y académica independiente, la doctora Tomi ha trabajado con el Queens Museum de Nueva York para la exposición Global Conceptualism, con el Tate Modern de Londres para Century City y con el Getty Institute Getty Research Institute para Art, Anti-Art, Non-Art, entre muchas otras colaboraciones. Su primera monografía, Radicalism in the Wilderness, International Contemporaneity and the 1960s Art in Japan, fue publicada por MIT Press en 2016. Este libro recibió el premio Robert Motherwell Book Award de 2017 y en 2019 se transformó en una exposición del mismo nombre. Su erudición, especialmente su exploración metodológica de, arte, de historia del arte mundial y los múltiples modernismos, resuena cada vez más entre los académicos que trabajan en otras reg regiones no occidentales. Durante los últimos años antes de la pandemia, la doctora Tommy ha viajado para dar conferencias en Beijing, Seúl, Singapur y Australia, además de otras ciudades de Estados Unidos y de Europa. En 2020, la doctora Tommy recibió el premio del Comisionado de Asuntos Culturales del Gobierno Japonés por sus contribuciones al intercambio cultural internacional. Welcome, Tommy Sensei. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for. Thank you for kind introduction, and I'm very happy to. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm very happy to be here. Let me share screen. <coughs> By now. It has been widely accepted that there are multiple modernisms whose multiplicity lies in diverse historical contexts within which works that may look similar in form to Western modernism or modernism in other locales come to have different significance when understood within their local circumstances. <clears throat> Such insights can also be brought to bear in contemporary art as well which prides itself in being global, and as a result, tends to assume equi equivalency between practices that had surface resemblances. Collectivism is one such area that demands careful local localized consideration. In my book of 2016, Radicalism in the Wilderness, International Contemporaneity and 60s Art in Japan, and the exhibition I curated at Japan Society in New York City in 19, uh, 2019, based on my book. Two distinctly post-war forms of collectivism are represented by Matsuzawa Yutaka and the play along with Gan. Matsuzawa Yutaka is a pioneer conceptualist. The book and the exhibition includes his networking with like-minded colleagues in Japan and abroad who pursued conceptualism in immaterial and spiritual dimensions, frequently incorporating performative activities in their work. Under the idea of Nirvana School, he organized on a, which, is liter which literally means sound gathering. On a is a performance program with his friends held in 71 in a remote mountain site near Matsuzawa's residence in central Japan. Participants gave their individual acts, and then in this sense, it's a kind of performance exhibition with few public audience. 
This represents an evolved form of exhibition-based collectivism. If Matsuzawa's networking brought works by various individuals to one place, the play worked to gather various individuals to collaborate on a single project. This I call it project-based collectivism, as opposed to exhibition-based collectivism. From 1968 onward, the play annually staged a large-scale summer project almost over two decades. Their collaborative and communal projects were voyages into landscape through which to shake our consciousness out of the complacency of everyday life. Among the places they traveled, the farthest is, is Minami Daitojima, an island 40, 400 kilometers east of Okinawa, where sugarcane had once been a major agricultural product. Notably, they were both inhabit inhabitants of the wilderness. Their sites of activities were away from Tokyo, the political and cultural center of Japan, away from the institutional framework of the art world. In their expression, they radically moved away from the conventional art making. This is the wilderness I explored in my book and exhibition, Radicalism in the Wilderness. And those two are prominently featured in my project. In my book, the wilderness is more than a remote landscape with layers of historical implications with the Chinese character, ya, as in Koya in Japanese. The wilderness stands for being outside of the seat of power, either by circumstances or by choice in the traditional East Asian vocabulary. In China, politicians descend to the wilderness, when they lose their positions in the court and the government. Literati painting was part of this tradition with Scala painters withdrawing from the seat of power to critique the officially sanctioned academic painting. In modern Japan, being in the wilderness, Zaya gained a positive connotation of not participating in the institutional systems. Indeed, Zaya is the term frequently invoked by artists in Kuriwa, Japan, informing exhibition societies called Vijutsu Dantai in the do-it-yourself spirit of seeking alternatives. Whether in pre-war Japan or post-war Japan, when artists operate in the wilderness, they had little institutional support for what they aspire to achieve. They had to make it happen on their own. And they did. In the wilderness, opportunity is something you must create yourself. That's the basic premise of do-it-yourself collectivism. This spirit runs through modern and contemporary art in Japan, informing an important segment of its evolution to this day. It is no exaggeration to say that if we, we don't understand the history of collectivism in Japan, we would not get the full picture of the evolution of modernism in Japan. Yet, it is a daunting topic that took me a long time to understand its structural significance in modernism. In today's talk, I will present the structural outline. Collectivism is a source of vitality, ingenuity, and creativity of Japanese art since the late 19th century, when the modern notion of art or bijutsu was introduced. We have to remember that back then, there was no art museum as such, and the idea and the practice of art exhibition also had to be introduced as a new mode of public display. Granted, state did its share of building the modern institutions of art. Still, the top-down modernization was not enough to create a lively platform to explore and disseminate modernism. It also required the bottom-up efforts wherein artists were the principal agent of change seeking not only alternative modes of expression, but also alternative sites of operation. Collectivism and do-it-yourself spirit were their ma major weapon. In the cognition of this local tradition, I have introduced and defined the concept of operation as an integral part of an artist's work. 
An artist's labor consists of two kinds of work, expression and operation. Expression typically takes place inside a studio. In the most conventional sense, an artist makes a painting or sculpture, which is in artist's expression. In art history, this has long been the topic of our study. Operation concerns an artist's effort to make his or her work public and otherwise engage society outside the studio. Generally speaking, the more mature the modern infrastructure of art became, the less need for an artist to engage in operation. However, in Japan for a long time, the art world infrastructure was not big enough, strong enough, or hospitable enough to offer full support to what innovative and experimental artists would aspire to do. In this environment, Japanese artists frequently took it upon themselves to create alternative platforms of activities crucial to presenting and disseminating their kinds of expression. Based on this observation, I define collectivism not just as a group activities, but as strategic alliances, primarily of artists motivated to seek and create alternatives to the existing options for expression or operation or both with the spirit of do it yourself. The form of collectivism evolved over years. From the 19th century through the prior years, the primary form of collectivism was Bijutsu Dantai or artist organizations which essentially served an exhibition societies. Dantai is the initial form of exhibition-based collectivism. In those days, the art world was structured around the stage salon and other salon exhibition hosted by the major Bijutsu Dantai. Against this background of the status quo, new Bijutsu Dantai emerged as a way to create an alternative platform. It fostered a sense of camaraderie among like-minded colleagues working in a similar style or a similar idea, devised exhibition and sales opportunities to promote their aesthetic positions through creating a presence by the number. Creating a new Bijutsu Dantai was a do-it-yourself way of creating a new and alternative platform in the art world. For example, Hakubakai, well, White Horse Society was established in 1898 by Kuro Daseiki, an influential oil painter to advocate a perennial quasi-impressionist style of painting in opposition to a dark-toned older style advocated by the Meiji Bijutsukai or Meiji Art Society. In terms of the art world politics, earlier that year, Kuroda was appointed to teach oil painting at the state-run Tokyo School of Fine Art. So this, uh, his power base was being expanded. However, it was highly desirable that his fa faction had its own exhibition platform because the exhibition was a crucial vehicle of public interface, a public forum of communication to cultivate the broader social recognition of their art. A major realignment occurred in 1904 when the state government instituted the National Salon, Bunten, short for Ministry of Education Art Exhibition, in strong critique of the conservative jury system, progressive painters soon established Nikakai, Second Section Society, and Nihon Bijutsuin, Japan Art Academy, shortened as Inten respectively in the field of yoga, Western style painting, and Nihonga, Japanese style painting. What you see on the screen is uh, two examples of Nihonga painting. Those anti-salon groups, including Nika and Nihon Bijutsuin, which embrace the spirit of Zaya or the wilderness, initially created their own exhibition platforms as alternatives to the government salon. But many of them ended up each becoming a sort of mini establishment, thanks to the financial stability brought about by the successful salon operations, 
which annually generated admission fees by visitors and entry fees by artists eager to show their work in, these, their, in those exhibitions. Together with the government salon, the main Zaya organization soon formed the larger status quo. This created constant need for new alternatives. Thus, in pre-war Japan, the status quo was not only stable, but also expanding, with one new dantai formed after another. The art world was teeming with literally dozens of dantai, which have been codified in two diagrams like chronologies, one for yoga and another for nihonga, and then we are looking at the, uh, the history of modern Japanese art nihonga in the form of the uh, lineage of uh, artist dantai. And then this kind of uh, diagram is a staple of the survey textbook as well as survey encyclopedic survey book. Thus, in pre-war Japan, the status quo was not on up. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the intricate genealogy of modern art in Japan was fraught with favoritism and artistic stagnation that came with the jury salon system. By 1945, Dante outlived their efficacy, yet their staying power was so formidable that we can see the former state salon now called Nitten, and many Priwa Dantai still operating today, and then uh, they look nothing but anachronism by the, uh, the examples of paintings shown at the uh, uh, Nitten, uh, the former government salon in 2019. Yet, as a historian, I had to ask, what was their historical contribution? In Prima Japan, as Japanese artists negotiated their ways through the formation of modernity, their aesthetic interest and operational interest as collectively represented in Dantai overlap with a broader public interest because Dantai helped to slowly and incrementally acclimate Japanese society to modern art, which was initially an unfamiliar Western import just as it took a long time for Japanese artists to formulate their own modernism. It took a long time for the general taste, understanding and knowledge of modern art to grow among the public. And anti collectivism enabled this evolution. That was Dante's operational contribution in pre-war Japan. In post-war Japan, however, Dante was deemed hindrance to progress and de democratization of art and rightly so. A progressive segment of art world endeavored to dismantle the entire Dantai establishment, which all operated on the feudalistic jury membership system. Some thought the time was right for independent exhibition. The idea of independent exhibition harks back to the Salon de Refusé of 1863 in Paris, but the system did not take root in pre-war Japan. Only in post-war post Japan did the independent exhibition become a possible and sustaining platform for change set against the entire salon-based art establishment. In Tokyo, two independent exhibitions were launched in 47 and 49, initially both called Japan Independent Exhibition. The substantial operational support came from organizations outside the arts themselves. These two independent exhibitions offered to young artists opportunities to present their work to a major audience without having to cultivate any relationship with the Dantai establishment, which as a result receded from the forefront of new art. To make a long story short, the second independent exhibition launched in 49, backed by the Omiuri, one of Japan's three major dailies, open the door to a new era of Gendai Bijutsu or literary contemporary art. In post-war Japan, an intriguing thing happened. The relic from pre-war Japan, Dantai continued as an extension of Kindai Bijutsu, literary modern art, 
strongly supported by the general public, but all but invisible to anyone outside Japan. At the same time, Gendai Bijutsu developed outside the Dante establishment, revealing a strong resonance with contemporary global and Western practices and bringing about the state of international contemporaneity by the 1960s. The formation of Gendai Bijutsu entailed a new form of collectivity. Being much smaller, more flexible, and more fluid than Dantai, Shudan or small collectives already existed in pre-war Japan. However, they became more viable in post-war Japan. Partly thanks to the independent exhibitions, these collectives no longer needed or wanted to organize a jury salon exhibition to raise their public profile. Indeed, they now took advantage of an increasing number of rental galleries, occasional opportunities to exhibit at the newly instituted modern art museums and art journalism that assumed a larger role in anointing new talents and trends. Over the course of what I call the expanded 1960s from 54 to 74, another major uh, paradigmatic shift took place. From exhibition-based collectivism to project-based collectivism. This shift began with Gutai. No discussion of post-war collectivism is complete without Gutai, but no discussion of collectivism is more complicated than about Gutai because Gutai is a hybrid of Dantai and Shudan. The Gutai leader, Yoshihara Jiro, was a pre-war veteran of Dantai who climbed the ladder of membership to become a full member of Nika, the first Zaya organization in oil painting. Within Nika, he experimented with a small Shudan operation in the name of Kyushitsukai. Uh, meaning a ninth room society, gathering young Nika members practicing abstraction and surrealism. Contrary to Nika, which has continued to this day, Kyushitsukai was short lived, partly due to wartime restrictions. After the end of World War II, Yoshihara embarked on a mission to create a new painting culture partly inspired by Pollock and other examples of gesture obstruction he personally saw in 1951. Unable to find like-minded artists in his generation, he turned to much younger artists attending his informal studio teaching and later actively recruited promising talents. He mentored them using two instructions never imitate others, make something that never existed. From his Kuriwa experiences, Yoshihara was, Yoshihara was well aware of the pros and cons of both large dantai and small shudan. And he took the best of the two, innovation in expression from shudan and stability in operation from dantai. Instead of the dreaded jury system that encouraged the reproduction of the house style, Yoshihara served as the sole judge to determine what would be new and good. An autocratic leader, however, he made sure to prompt innovation by inventing new exhibition formats that incorporated outdoor venues, the stage, and the mass media press. In response, the members devised new expressions that transcended the established conventions. Their first several months in Asia in 1955 was their research and development period, preparing for their debut in Tokyo to mount the first ever Gutai art exhibition in October 55. In retrospect, we may characterize Gutai as a mission-driven project team led by Yoshihara who envisioned a new post pollock painting culture. The members strive hard and magnificently achieved his vision in terms of expression. On his part, the leader kept a close eye on stability and continuity. Once the members found their voices, 
that is created their signature styles. He encouraged them to mature their expression, sometimes discouraged further experiments. He organized the semi-regular Gutai art exhibitions to offer the place for his members to demonstrate not only their innovations, but also their maturations. Meanwhile, he continued to recruit new talents in order to maintain and revitalize the group creative drive. And he built Kutai Pinakoteka in Osaka, the group's headquarters with exhibition space, which was an ultimate do-it-yourself platform he could have for his dream project of international networking. Throughout the 60s, collectivism proliferated nationwide. And this is the, uh, the map of Japan as uh, represented by a number of small shudan collectives. In Tokyo and elsewhere, the search for alternative modes of expression or alternative site of operation was waged on the streets by such anti-art collectives as Kyushuha, Niodada, Hyred Center, and Zero Dimension, among others, in part inspired by the under, undying urge for di direct action, stoked by the intense nationwide protest against the renewal of AMPO, short for the US-Japan Security Treaty, that threw the whole nation into political turmoil in 1960. Paradigmatic was Hyred Center and their cleaning event in 1964. In cleaning event, Hyred Center executed a guerrilla project on the Avon Street in broad daylight. The artist acted as anonymous alien agents in the urban environment. Although their understated tongue-in-cheek performance was not meant to block or disrupt pedestrian traffic, they obtained no permission from the authorities to use the streets, making their work unlawful. The criticality of Hyred Center's cleaning event lies in their mocking subversion of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government's beautification program, which had been ch changing the face of Tokyo in preparation for the 1960 Tokyo Olympics. Their mockery consists of a few hilarious elements, including the use of ridiculous indoor cleaning instruments, a toothbrush, a broom for tatami mat, and the like on the public street. In cleaning event, they memorably merged expression and operation. While cleaning constitutes their expression, they did not show it in the exhibition, which is a customary place for an artist to generate a public and social interface for their work. Instead, the group undertook this expression to the streets, brought it directly to their potential viewers. In other words, their direct action generated direct interface. That is to say, the operation was their expression and vice versa. In the exhibition context, the group members showed together, but their individual works are separately produced in their respective studios. In contrast, the project, in, in the project context, the group members work together to achieve a single outcome, thus a different level of together, togetherness is engendered. This counters the modernist assumption of the autonomy of the work of art and singular authorship. These ventures onto the street were part of the descent to the everyday, the phrase the critic Miyakawa Atsushi coined in difference to the extreme junk tendency of anti-art, Hangeijutsu. The critical idea equally applied to those street performances and are taken on the everyday street. In January 64, the Yomiuri newspaper company decided to terminate the independent exhibition, wary of the out of control transgressions by anti-art practitioners. Two reactions arose from artists who enjoyed the once a year opportunity to show their work in a museum context. One camp was represented by the critic Tono Yoshiaki, who coolly observed that there was just one less venue 
in which to exhibit. Such anti art pioneers as Shinohara Ushio, Miki Tomio, and Nakanishi Natsuyuki generally agreed with him. They went off museum, forming loose assemblies of like minded colleagues to stage small group exhibitions at the growing number of Kashigaro or rental galleries an important building broke in post-war Japan serving as alternative spaces. The most famous was called Off Museum, which was staged at the rental Tsubaki Kindai Gallery and outdoor venues, including the dry riverbed of Tama River. Another notable Off Museum exhibition was by Sightseeing Art Research Institute, the tag for duo Nakamura Hiroshi and Taiga Tateishi Koichi, who created a gigantic one day outdoor installation, a panorama of sightseeing art at the Tama River, complete with a Mount Fuji made of cheap metal plate. The outdoor camp, uh, I'm sorry, the other camp believed that the new independent exhibition must be organized by artists themselves to embody a truly independent spirit. Its most ardent proponent was the critic Haru Ichiro, who managed to arrange independent 64 at none other than the Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum, where the corporate sponsored Yomiuri Independent Exhibition used to be held. Independent 64 was followed by a mini movement of artists organized independent exhibitions many of them outside Tokyo. In December 64, Matsuzawa Yutaka organized Independent 64 in the wilderness at Nanashima Yashima Highland near his home in Shimosuwa in central Japan. Having had a major breakthrough in his immaterial conceptualism area in June 64, he disavowed the use of material objects in his work under the mantra of vanishing of matter. Instead, he advocated that the viewer should deploy their mental faculty to see the invisible in their mind's eye. Independent 64 in the Wilderness was an imaginary exhibition that at once demonstrated the efficacy of Matsuzawa's immaterialism and his alliance to the artists organized independent exhibition movement. This, uh, this demonstrates a regional nature of the artist organized independent exhibitions, underscored by the geographical imbalance with Tokyo. It was practically impossible for regional artists to go off museum as effectively as their Tokyo counterparts, because they did not have ready access to rental galleries in their hometowns. For the regional artists, the loss of Yomiuri independent was not just one less venue in which to exhibit. It was all or nothing in terms of showing in Tokyo. She's organizing a national scale exhibition that is calling for participation from all over the country would require a substantial amount of logistical planning and investment of time and labor on the part of organizers. It was sensible that some of them plan to take turns to produce annual exhibition cited, cited at a locale where the lead organizers resided. Still, it turned out to be a huge operational undertaking for artists and it did not last long. The most successful was independent art festival held in Gifu in 65, the first in the regional annual series. It attracted the participating artists from around the country to central Japan and gained a good deal of art critical attention. Notable was an outdoor section staged at the dry river bed of Nagara River, where two works stood out, Ho by Group E from Kobe and Homo sapiens by Ikemizu Keiichi from Osaka. The practitioners achieved scale necessary in a vast open air setting. Group E produced hall on site by silently toiling under the scorching summer sun for the duration of the exhibition, digging a hole 
10 meters wide and filling it back by the end of the exhibition. Ikemizu put himself inside a two by two meter cage with a multilingual label, Jinrui Homo sapiens, Ningen Man, followed by the uh, male sign. Critics duly noted these artists' use of the body as significant element in expression. There was another significant commonality that is in operation. At the Omeru Independent Exhibition, anti-art practitioners were guests in a corporate organized exhibition in which they sought to create subversion and transgression on purpose by going against the conventions of art making and open the museum regulations. The newspaper company terminated the exhibition unable to contain the artist's irresponsible behaviors. In Gifu and elsewhere, the artist quickly came to realize that social responsibility was indispensable part of the equation for both organizers and participants. In Gifu, of special concern was the use of a dry riverbed of Nagara River. The artists had to be mindful about a few challenges, the reverse regulation, the presence of tourists and other unsuspecting people, and the summer weather condition in the steep mountain areas where the river was prone to sudden severe floods. The organizers called for meetings to devise their own exhibition rules. No distraction was allowed because the river law stipulated that the site should be returned to its original state after the exhibition. Hazardous materials were discarded to ensure public safety at the major tourist site. And the dimensions of the work were set at maximum weight of 150 kilograms and maximum measurement, for example, of 200 centimeter high so that it could be promptly moved out of the site when a flood warning should be issued. Anti-art practitioners might have scoffed at such restrictions of hampering freedom of expression, but Group E and Ikemis both successfully create the most memorable and critical work in the exhibition while staying within these self-imposed parameters. By digging a hole and filling it back, not only did Group E adhere to the river law, returning the site to the original state that is, but also they captured the world beyond individualism through a purposeless act, whereby the collaboration in and of itself led to self-revelation in their words. A kind of happening, Ikemizu's Homo sapiens represented the artist's attempt to confront the human condition confined in the cage of civilization, symbolized by a cage that could be easily carried out of the site by a few people upon a moment's notice. For Ikemizu, a future member of the play, this experiment was seminal. It inspired him to institute a happening section, the first of its kind in Japan in the Contemporary Art Festival which he co-organized in Osaka in August 1966 to follow GIF's independent exhibition. A year later, this led to a more focused endeavor with the first play exhibition, a three-day program of happenings, which he co-organized with his performance-minded peers in a public playground in Kobe. In these presentations, individual artists staged relatively small scale performance works under the conventional rubric of exhibition. Then came Voyage happening in an egg in July 68, which definitively merged operation and expression into a single large scale collaborative project undertaken in public space. project constituted of a simple but daring idea. Release a huge two by three meter egg into the Japan current in the Pacific Ocean. Since the Japan current flows into the California current, which reaches the continental US, there was a slight chance that the egg might traverse the big ocean and reach America. 
Along with the group members, the project involved an associate professor of oceanography and the head of a local fishers union in Kushimoto, Wakayama Prefecture, a township from which the group set out into the Pacific Ocean. The two non-artists passionately supported the group improbable project. So much so, the professor wrote a letter of recommendation to the prefecture fishery department, which suspected the group was secretly planning a publicity stunt. In order to vouch for the project's bona fide oceanographic and, uh, bona fide oceanographic and aesthetic significance, and its potential to raise public awareness about oceanography. The union had offered one fishing boat for the project and arranged another for hire. By clearing the final hurdle, obtaining an environmental permit from the Marine Safety Department for throwing an object into the open sea, the group successfully released the egg. After a month, they received one telegraph of sighting, but no news after that. Encouraged by the success of Voyage, the group would organize a large scale summer project annually in diverse locations in the wilderness, rivers, mountains, a lake, an island in Okinawa, and a plain in Hokkaido. These uh, uh, painted in green is the, uh, their annual summer project. With the play, unlike Dante collectivism, continuity in operation inspired innovation and expression. After the ocean, they wanted to do another kind of body of water, hence rafting downstream the river. After, so this is the uh, going down the river with the uh, plastic raft. After the wind uh, in Hokkaido, uh, wind, this is a uh, wandering in the wind, walking against the wind in Hokkaido. They referenced the traditional pairing of wind god and thunder god and ended up with thunder, which occupied the group over the next 10 years. Furthermore, continuity in operation helped them to formulate a unique kind of communal collectivism and mature it. Discussion and collaboration were their hallmark in their often year-long preparation process. The memberships uh, changed from year to year, but in its near horizontal organization, everybody contributed something to each project. In addition, the place of collaboration with non-members an essential part of their projects to express gratitude for out outside support. The praise official membership roster always included all the past members, participants, and supporters, both individual and institutional. So this list includes oceanographic professor as well as the local fishery union too. In their latest such compilation dated in 2014, five current members are listed along with 120 individuals and 13 institutions plus four translators of their publications. The praise law abiding spirit, communal decision making, experimental nature of their experiential nature of their project and the involvement of regular people amply demonstrating a dimension of social engagement that prefigure today's socially engaged art. Through their collaborative and communal operation, the Prey found, found a new way to present independent expression that departed from any, any reliance on exhibition. It should be noted that they invented this strategy by learning from their post experiences and their own practices when there was no set template for communal collectivism or a few precedents for finding ways to reach out to people and the public outside the existing infrastructure of exhibition. From the perspective of relation, this is, this in and of itself makes the play a singular presence in the history of collectivism 
in modern and contemporary Japan. Thank you. This is the end of my lecture. Thank you so much, Reiko Sensei. Um, I, I would like to take the opportunity to, to ask you how, how you see collectivism nowadays in, in the current Japanese art scene. Is it that relevant as it was in the 20th century art scene? Yes, it is. Um, more so in a very fluid and networking way because the uh, contempt, uh, because nowadays uh, it is very customary for artists to get together to create a large project to involve regular people at the museum or the, at the art festival and then sometime art fair too. So the, uh, and then by doing that, they can bring in different talents and then uh, different the, uh, thinking and then uh, they can create a scale uh, and, uh, impossible for an individual practitioner. So the uh, interestingly, I'm finding more and more groups in Japan, and it's very difficult to catch up. So I showed you the uh, pre-war uh, Dante uh, diagram. There are so many, uh, you know, Dante, you know, all strings together. And I also show a Japanese map of Japan with the lots of uh, different collectives. I don't know how to draw a map today because uh, probably it's too dense to really a huge, huge map to, the, uh, to uh, represent all the uh, small groups uh, in all over Japan. Uh, yeah, and then also another thing is uh, in the 60s, Tokyo is the main place and then the like, wilderness or the regional cities, there are a few spots that the, uh, you know, important, uh, you know, very active areas. Now, every city, in you know all over the country is the spot for uh, you know the site for contemporary art. Actually, the uh, contemporary art people organizers tend to actually choose to go to wilderness, the remote areas, to create the uh, art festival to revitalize the uh, the uh, declining uh, regions. A depopulated or loss of the uh, industry or agricultural practices. So the uh, in that situation, number you know getting together, working with, to, working together on various levels from the volunteers to the artists to the uh, local people. That's the uh, the crucial uh, element for success. So the uh, if I. I didn't come to that far to discuss uh, my uh, lecture uh, to, to connect it, but the, uh, I, I thought it's important to just see the, uh, the root of what we see today. So all over the place, Japan. Thank you so much for your, your answer. Uh, yeah, I, with your explanation, I was thinking about Naoshima Mm, yes, definitely, <laughs> yes. And then uh, Naoshima is one thing, which is actually more by the, uh, originated by a collector who mm -hmm. wanted to bring the, uh, you know, culture to the uh, remote islands in the Inland Sea. But there, like, you know, the, another important precedent was Echigo Tsumari, which was uh, in, uh, cited in Niigata. Niigata is where Gan was, where Gan did the uh, snow countries, uh, huge uh, uh, the uh, color field painting. And then uh, so Gan kind of pioneered uh, before the, uh, anybody thinking about art festival to uh, make, you know, local people's, uh, you know, happier, uh, mm -hmm. even for a moment. So the, uh, it, it is very interesting phenomenon right now in Japan. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was very, very interesting to hear about it. And well, thank you for today's conference. So now I would like to, to switch to Spanish to, to mm -hmm. this conference. Thank you so much. It, this, this is the last one. So uh, thank you so much for all the knowledge you, you shared through the 
through the past conferences. Um, bueno, muchas gracias a todos los que nos acompañaron en esta conferencia y en la serie de actividades que tuvimos durante el mes de marzo con la doctora Reiko Tomi. Eh, si se perdieron alguna conferencia, si quieren volver a ver esta conferencia, todas las van a poder encontrar a través de nuestra página de YouTube. Pueden encontrarnos como Fundación Japón en México y eh, todas van a contar con subtítulos por si quieren eh, volverlas a ver o si las vieron en inglés y si la quieren ver con los subtítulos en español, estarán disponibles en nuestro canal de YouTube y también en las redes sociales de todos los museos con los que hicimos colaboración e institutos de, de investigación. También me gustaría eh, reiterar mi agradecimiento al Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Querétaro por su colaboración con esta conferencia. Esperamos que, que al público eh, que sigue a este museo le, le haya parecido muy interesante, tanto como a nosotros. Eh, no sé, director Papu, si, si quieras eh, despedirte antes de, de que cerremos esta sesión. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, quiero agradecer a todo el equipo de la Fundación Japón de México por esta conferencia y en particular a la doctora Tomi. Eh, es un tema que no abordamos mucho, que conocemos poco y que creo que nos, eh, nos aclaró mucho de, de las actividades que están haciendo. Otra vez muchas gracias y esperemos seguir colaborando juntos. Muchas gracias por sus palabras y bueno, les agradecemos a todos su atención y esperamos verlo, verlos pronto en otras de nuestras actividades. Gracias. <risa>